Well, let's get started. I'm Richard Lalonde. Uh, I'm uh, HIV, hepatitis C, and ID physician here at McGill, one of the uh, organization committee members. And it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Chris Power, who's a uh, professor of medicine, a uh, specialist in uh, neurology, and he will be talking to us this morning, and he comes from the uh, University of Alberta in Edmonton. He's a CAR, a, a CIHR research uh, fellow, uh, chair in Edmonton. And uh, this morning he will be talking to us about a topic that has become very hot in recent years, and that's a topic of neuro-HIV. Uh, Chris, in his uh, younger days, was the first uh, neuro fellow to develop an HIV dementia scale back in the days when we saw really bad dementia uh, associated with HIV, and that was back in the early 1990s, and he's remained very interested in the field of HIV-related uh, neurologic diseases, as well as a whole bunch of other diseases where the immune system is involved in the neuropathogenesis. So, the most important aspect, though, of uh, Dr. Power's uh, CV is he comes to us from a very high-flying medical school. He graduated from the University of Ottawa, and I know that one very well because that's where I graduated also. So, uh, <clears throat> and that's his major claim to fame. In spite of the 150 peer-reviewed papers that he's written and everything like that, the most important part of his career is having gone to medical school in Ottawa. So, uh, so Dr. Powers will be talking to us about NeuroAIDS, a view from the clinic and the laboratory. He will give his talk, there will be about a five minute question period which he will address, and then I will come back up and thank him after that. So he'll go straight into the question period. Dr. Powers. Good morning, and uh, I want to begin by uh, thanking the meeting organizers. for This is really a true honor to be uh, invited to talk about um, HIV in the nervous system. This is a, it's a problem that uh, arguably has been under-recognized. I know there's been a, a, a real surge of interest in the last few years, but in fact, this is a problem that's been with us since the beginning of the epidemic. The early studies in the, in the very uh, early 18, uh, 1980s uh, indicated that there were neurological deficits associated with HIV infection. Now, I want to, uh, I also want to say that uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk about a series of topics. I'm really going to give you sort of a sampler of what's current in HIV-related neurologic disease. Um, much of this work that we're doing is predicated on studies done both in Edmonton and Calgary. I used to be in Calgary. I've given you a picture of, of Edmonton because um, some of you uh, may not have been there before, and this is a picture of our lovely River Valley. But I know that most of you suspect it's like this most of the year. And indeed, it's not. It's actually a lovely place to live. So um, I, what I'll do is I'll cover several topics. I'm going to talk about uh, HIV-related uh, neurologic disease, the profile, uh, and then I'll also talk about HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, because that's really something that's come to the forefront in the last few years. I'll talk about cerebral penetration efficacy of individual antiretrovirals. Um, I'm going to talk about neuroiris as well, because that is a challenging problem clinically for which we really don't understand the pathogenesis and, we and don't have much to offer clinically. I'll talk about comorbidities. HCV is a growing problem. I think it's a, a problem across the continent, and, uh, and it's a, a very challenging problem that you may or may not uh, uh, appreciate the extent of the problem. And lastly, I'm actually going to switch gears and just talk about the brain biology and how it might be affected by, uh, by HIV, because there are some uh, considerations that you might, might not have occurred to you. If there's one message that I could send to all of you, it's, it's critical when, uh, to, uh, particularly to the clinicians, and I don't just mean physicians, I mean nurses, f uh, uh, pharmacists, social workers, anybody who's involved in clinical care, it's really important to ask about neurologic disease because it's often lost in the face of other medical problems and, uh, and it actually has a substantial uh, impact on the quality of life, survival in some cases, um, and, it's, uh, and it's in many, many situations it can be alleviated to some extent. So as I mentioned, 
Uh, neurologic disease is very much a feature of HIV infection, but that should not come as a surprise because many retroviruses um, uh, induce neurologic disease. I, on, the, on this slide, you can see that HIV is part of the lentivirus family, and of course, SIV the, uh, also causes neurologic disease, um, and likewise, feline immune deficiency virus causes uh, neurologic disease in about 10% of urban cats as well. And the other viruses such as uh, EIAV, which is a virus in horses, equine infectious anemia virus, or also called swamp fever, uh, causes neurologic disease uh, as well. Visnavirus was, was the original model for multiple sclerosis because it causes neurologic disease. So you can see that there's a lot of rationale for, or it's very plausible that neurologic disease is caused directly by HIV infection. There are other ret human retroviruses, HTLV1, which produce neurologic disease. And more recently, people have been interested in the role of the HERVs, and um, HERVW and HERVK, and their po posited role in neurologic disease. And that's really, uh, those, these are non-infectious uh, human endogenous retroviruses, non-transmissible, but do express proteins and may amplify uh, the d uh, disease severity and, and course. So we, we like to think of neurologic disease in, in two sort of ca rough categories. There's the primary HIV-induced uh, neuro-AIDS syndromes, which I've, are shown on this slide, but in addition, there are also the secondary opportunistic infections that arise due to uh, immunosuppression and are unique in themselves. But I'm not going to talk about this latter group this morning, simply because it, would, it just would take too much time. Today in the, in the clinic, the, the burden of, of neurologic disease lies with these primary HIV-induced uh, syndromes. <clears throat> And they occur at any time during infection, at the time of seroconversion, during the asymptomatic period, as well as into AIDS. And the bulk of disease occurs during AIDS, although that's increasing, it's increasingly recognized that it precedes the onset of AIDS in many in instances. HIV infects all levels of the nervous system, giving rise to this profile of neurologic disorders that you can see on the slide in front of you. It, can, it is associated with an increased frequency of Guillain-Barre, uh, mononeuritis multiplex. Distal sensory polyneuropathy, or painful sensory uh, polyneuropathy, remains a major problem in the clinic, um, as I'll show you in a moment. And likewise, myopathies uh, are also a feature, not just drug-induced myopathies, but also primary inflammatory myopathies. The central nervous system has really captured the most attention, though, in terms of neurologic disease. Uh, whether it's seizures or uh, aseptic meningitis, uh, th those, are, uh, those, are, uh, those are serious issues that arise, and the risk of epilepsy in patients with HIV is high, much higher than the general population. But the syndrome today that really I think we're all very interested in is the role of HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. And that, I'll come back to that in a moment, but that's really sort of three disorders of increasing uh, severity of disease. But in addition, HIV also causes spinal cord disease. We don't see it as frequently as we used to, but nonetheless, it still exists, a myelopathy. So HAND has, has really uh, uh, been a, a major concern for a variety of reasons, notably the uh, in, uh, occurrence of neurologic disease in the setting of complete viral suppression. And that, and, that, and that remains a bit of an enigma. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But HAND is, uh, uh, is really a syndrome that uh, was defined by a, a working group in uh, 2007 in Frascati in Italy, where a group of people decided that the, the neurocognitive impairment really needed to be looked at again and, and stratified into different groups. This to strategy, to some extent, comes from the Alzheimer's literature where there's so-called minor cognitive impairment which precedes frank dementia. So in hand, there are three syndromes. There's HIV-associated dementia where people are very impaired, unable to care for themselves, and, unable, and, uh, um, and they uh, have substantial disability, often being institutionalized. Minor neurocognitive impairment, patients are aware of, of the problem, they're symptomatic, they may or may not work, they may or may not be able to uh, care for themselves completely, but they can live independently. Um, and certainly we see people go from HIV dementia to minor neurocognitive disorder with the implementation of antiretroviral therapy. The last syndrome, asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, or a a ANI, is really something that's become um, something that we've recognized most recently. And for a long time there was some concern that it really was it just sort of an artifact of, 
uh, various types of neuro neurocognitive testing. But indeed, it now, there's now data to suggest that if you have asymptomatic neurocognitive impairment, in other words, you're functioning in society, you're able to work, but you're unaware of the cognitive impairment, you're if you do indeed exhibit neurocognitive deficits, the risk of going on to develop minor neurocognitive disorder, or worse still, frank dementia, is about fourfold risk, fourfold increased. So it, it is a, definitely a risk factor, and this is just presented uh, about a month and a half ago at the Croy meeting by uh, Igor Grant's group the, uh, uh, in San Diego. <coughs> um, the syndrome, and it is syndromic, is, is quite distinct. It's different from Alzheimer's disease. So it's really the classic triad of uh, uh, executive dysfunction with difficulty with memory, uh, inability to make decisions, uh, difficulty with problem solving. Uh, and the thing that many, many people will tell you is that, oh, I've just slowed down. I'm just not as sharp as I was. It takes me longer to do things. It takes me longer to uh, perform menial tasks that I would have been able to do uh, in the past. However, that's only one dimension. A second dimension is the uh, neuropsychiatric, neurobehavioral features. Patients can, with, uh, with a hand can exhibit uh, uh, apathy. Um, sometimes it can be the other extreme and frank mania um, and, and agitation. Motor features are also a feature of the, of the syndrome. Tremor, unsteadiness on their gait or ataxia, and definitely slowed function. So often patients will exhibit almost a Parkinson's-like syndrome, stooped, shuffling uh, uh, gait. But that's always in the context of some immunodeficiency at some point, and A, and B, usually uh, there is virus in the brain. And that's based largely on autopsy studies. But, so you need these requisite features to develop the syndrome, virus in the brain, as well as uh, immunodeficiency. This is work from uh, our own group. Uh, uh, it's a cohort study, a clinical cohort that we follow in the Southern Alberta Clinic um, of patients, uh, roughly uh, 1,600 patients. We looked at the prevalence of neurologic disease. In a, in a, these patients all had access to highly active antiretroviral therapy. And I think you can see that distal sensory polyneuropathy, or DSP, remains a common problem. Uh, likewise, hand, and this is symptomatic hand, it's not asymptomatic. So just symptomatic hand uh, was also a common problem, but we also see other disorders as well. Uh, uh, seizures and opportunistic infections certainly are evident in the late presenters. Um, and that, uh, but um, the other thing I want to highlight though, many individuals who have one neurologic disorder may also have actually others if you look more, if you look closely. So someone may have some minor cognitive impairment, but they may also have neuropathy, uh, they might have a, a myelopathy as well. So, the overall prevalence of neurologic disease in this cohort was, a, and this is not just hand, this is all, all neurologic syndromes, was approximately 25%. A substantial burden of disease, no question. And in addition, about 45% of patients had one or, or two or more neurological syndromes. Again, a, a, a lot of neurologic disease. But what's most concerning, I think, is that the risk of or the survival is diminished substantially when you exhibit hand, and in fact, even collectively, all all neurologic disorders together, the survival really plummets. Um, and so, yes, we're doing a great job in rolling out antiretroviral therapy, but we're not tackling neurologic disease to, uh, as effectively as we might. Um, so what are the risk factors? Well, this is from our own study, and I'll talk about what else is, is known uh, from our own group. Uh, we know that the duration of infection, the longer you have it, the greater the likelihood is that you'll develop a uh, hand. Uh, if you're older, you'll also uh, exhibit a greater risk of, uh, of hand. And likewise, the uh, first viral load, if it's greater than a million, your likelihood of, uh, of hand is greater, and, like, and also a low CD4 nadir. In contrast to other groups, such as uh, Victor Valcourt's group and others, we did not find that, Vic, uh, that uh, the metabolic syndrome or vascular risk factors contributed to the risk of, uh, of hand. That's when we controlled on a multivariate analysis for age, so that may be the difference. Um, the other thing that uh, did not seem to uh, impact um, was the time of initiation of heart. Uh, in terms of uh, the risk of hand. And that's, that, uh, this is a small study uh, with all the caveats that are associated with it, but nonetheless, I think that's a serious consideration given the results of uh, studies like the ACCORD study. 
What about the clade issue? Well, that's a very interesting issue, and it's coming. It's uh, as, and Canada is unique uh, in that uh, in many respects because we have a, a large population of people coming from other countries, sub-Saharan Africa in, in particular. So we actually looked at that question. Several another group had, did also at Croy, and I think you can see that depending on the clay, we looked at C and B because they were the most abundant uh, um, clay uh, groups that we uh, studied. Hand, there's a, certainly an increased risk, but it's not significant. Uh, statistically significant in the uh, in the uh, B clay group. Neuropathy is much more common in the B clay group, even when you control for duration of infection. And likewise, opportunistic infections was higher in the C group, which is no doubt reflects perhaps the demographics, uh, because many of those patients were uh, late presenters. What's going on at the biological level? It remains an enigma, but we do know that in patients with hand, there is a loss of neurons, as illustrated in the slide but on the right-hand side. Uh, most, and, in a, and it's not just uh, cortical neurons that are in the right, up, upper, right upper hand, but also uh, subcortical neurons. But the part that when you get to a stage of loss of neurons, there isn't a whole lot that one can do. But in addition, the, more, the neurons are dysmorphic, and the actual processes that neurons extend, the so-called synapses, are the, the fir they're the first structure of a cell that is damaged, and they retract. And I, that is, I think, an, a window of opportunity for treatment, that if we can approach it that, uh, that, from that perspective, we may actually be able to enhance the recovery uh, of people who have my, at least minor neurocognitive disorder, if not mild uh, dementia. The other feature of the, of the disease process is that chronic, particularly innate immune activation, is very much part of the disease. So even in patients who have completely suppressed uh, viral loads with good CD4 counts, they will have, uh, their CSF will be positive for immune markers, such as neopterin, MCP2, or CCL2 as well. The understanding of the pathogenesis is uh, uh, a pretty conventional approach to many infectious diseases. We know that the virus enters the nervous system, uh, likely through infected cells. It infects cells within the nervous system, particularly the glial cells. Neurons are not infected. And then it's an indirect mechanism by which neurons, which are responsible for memory and concentration and motor function, are damaged. So it's different from, say, rabies infection or West Nile. But there are two mechanisms by which neurons are damaged. You can see in the lower part, viral proteins are directly secreted. Viral proteins such as VPR, which we've shown with Eric Cohen and others uh, to be uh, neurotoxic. GP120, uh, many people have shown that it's neurotoxic. And likewise, uh, TAT, which has uh, been studied extensively by Avi Nath, a Canadian who's now at the NIH. Conversely, on the other side, there's immunopathology. The virus induces a, a pathogenic immune response with the release of uh, chemokines, cytokines, such as uh, uh, TNF-alpha, free radicals, which also damage neurons. So there's a, there's a convergent pathogenic effects on neurons. And that's, that's a model that's used for studying many other uh, infectious diseases, including ones of the nervous system. What the impact is of heart on these mechanisms remains unknown. It's really unclear. Does heart, is heart really effective against neural cells that are infected, such as microglia or astrocytes? Those, remain, those questions remain unanswered uh, today. So we like to think of, uh, of neurologic disease in sort of a, a broader sense. We, we know that invasion of the nervous system is a feature, and that's dependent on, on the type of virus. Is your virus replication competent? The clade is, a, is another issue. What about the tropism? Certainly the viral load is dictated by what cells are infected, uh, and replication is as well. Host restriction factors, such as tetherin, uh, apobec, those, the role of those molecules in disease pathogenesis in the nervous system is unknown. Uh, at this stage. And finally, there's certainly a susceptibility to infection. So the extremes of, a or to neurologic disease. The extremes of age, children, the risk of HIV encephalopathy is about 50% unless they're treated. Um, likewise, older individuals, as I showed you, are at greater risk of, of hand. Likewise, there's certain genetics, predisposition. There's specific SNPs in, uh, in uh, SDF1, CCL2, TNF-alpha. Likewise, I mentioned uh, diabetes is a, is a comorbidity that will enhance the, or increase the likelihood of, of hand, as will uh, uh, HCV infection. Diagnosing hand is a uh, is really a uh, uh, requires a team effort. 
Uh, it requires a history and, and physical examination. You have to get third party history to confirm what's really going on. It's very hard just to, uh, based on face to face. Um, likewise, you need the requisite systemic blood work, such as CD4 and viral load. Mental, uh, mental status screening is a very popular theme these days. Uh, uh, Richard mentioned the HDS. That's been modified and translated into multiple languages now. The IHDS is another scale that's a derivative of it. The MOCA has been uh, studied in, in Canada and at the MNI, and there's a very nice paper from the MNI group showing that it's effective in, uh, in HIV or in hand. The CAMZ is a scale that's uh, being used, a computerized scale that's uh, uh, also effective. One thing I will emphasize, the Folstein mini mental state, which uh, people have Richard's in my generation grew up with is ineffective. Please don't use it, it just doesn't work. It's, it's very good for cortical dementia, but it's not good for subcortical dementias such as hand. Uh, neuroimaging is essential, uh, CT at minimum, preferably an MR if it's available. There's a lot of discussion about using a lumbar puncture uh, it is helpful to exclude other disorders uh, in some centers, such as the Sydney Center uh, in Australia. They're very keen on measuring viral load and, also, and genotype when it's appropriate. And that, uh, that's difficult to do, there's no question. Patients and, and caregivers are often reluctant to do a lumbar puncture. Um, um, and we, if we have time, we can discuss that during the question period. And a full neuropsych battery is a luxury when it's available, but it's certainly very informative. Um, and of course, one has to treat the uh, treatable causes. But I do want to emphasize this, that hand is merely a syndrome. And therefore, it requires an integrated uh, multimodal uh, diagnostic approach. It requires a team approach. It's not just a, the, the predicated on the wisdom of a prairie neurologist like me. It's got to be uh, other, it's got to involve the rest of the team. Uh, the primary care physicians, the nurses, the social workers, pharmacists are all very, they all provide important information. And I, I can't stress that enough. What about treatment for hand? <clears throat> well, certainly the first priority is to make sure that people are on adequate antiretroviral therapy, um, and that has to be looked at closely. You have to exclude drug resistance, and I'll, I, if we have time, we'll talk about it. This is a very interesting and challenging issue. Also, non-adherence is a major problem. Um, and the question of whether there is really a neuroheart regimen um, needs, needs to be addressed, which I'll get come to in a few minutes. Symptomatic treatment is really often what we're left with if we, if we know patients are on an effective antiretroviral therapy. Uh, we use memantine. It's not supported by an RCT. There was an RCT done that uh, the primary endpoint wasn't, uh, wasn't positive, but it was an underpowered study. Many people use dexedrin. I think it's a risky issue if someone has concurrent hypertension. Uh, modafinil, another drug that uh, gives people energy, uh, that may be of use, uh, help. I can't emphasize enough some motherhood things. Exercise, if a patient is able to do it, uh, is very effective. I've been asking patients to do this for years, and now I actually have some biology to back it up. Exercise increases, and this applies to all of us in the room, uh, exercise increases the blood flow to your brain, and it also increases the abundance of neurotrophins. Uh, and that's been shown in good studies now, and I think, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'm glad that what I've been saying for years has been, is truthful. Um, sleep is a big issue. It's a, and, and sleep, uh, cognitive impairment as a result of sleep disorders is a well-recognized problem. Sleep medicine in general is a hot subject. We know about this from uh, ephevirenz, which uh, definitely disrupts people's sleep, but I think it goes above and beyond ephevirenz. I think it's a general problem that needs to be addressed in the clinic and, and ask patients about it. Okay, well I want to talk about this very topical and, uh, and controversial issue of central nervous system penetration effectiveness ranking that was uh, championed or has been championed by uh, Scott Latond. Well, not so much championed, but let's say conceived by Scott. And he's, it's really a, a very important issue. Sort of working basis for this is that high CPE rankings is, is, uh, is associated with the suppression of virus um, in, the, in the brain and it's associated uh, by, implicitly by, uh, with improved neurocognitive function. Uh, <clears throat> CPE scoring is predicated on the, uh, on the sum of scores uh, derived from each individual's, uh, each individual antiretroviral uh, CSF uh, concentrations. There are some serious and major caveats to consider. One is that there are no measures of antiretroviral, or very few measures of antiretroviral, thera or antiretroviral thera therapy dr uh, levels or drug levels um, in brain parenchyma. CSF is an okay surrogate marker, but it's not the same as t brain tissue. So that, that's something to keep in mind. It's impossible to measure uh, tissue levels, but we have to keep that in mind. 
antiretroviral interactions with drugs, other drugs that patients might, uh, might be taking is an, a serious consider consideration. Individual variations in blood-brain barrier permeability that would or would not allow drugs into the nervous system is a, also a consideration. And um, certainly patients with dementia have an increased uh, blood-brain barrier permeability. And lastly, the off-target effects of antiretroviral therapies. Ephedrine's being one example um, that we know of for sure, uh, but there are likely others uh, as well. So it, there are some serious considerations in this thing, or in this concept. Um, these are the drugs that uh, are, have been assessed, uh, uh, and this is from another review by, by Scott Latond. And uh, the drugs that we know very well that have been around for some time are very effective at getting into the nervous system, notably zidovudine, nevarapine, and ritonavir, and, um, and indinavir. These are widely known and in some cases uh, uh, still used. Abacavir is uh, uh, one that uh, has very good CNS penetration, but it was not effective in, in treating people with dementia. I think you, many of you will know that trial. It was done by Bruce Brew years ago. Um, and then some drugs that are very effective in the clinic today don't get into the nervous system, such as uh, tenofovir. And that's a, that's a, considerate, a serious uh, concern as well. People have, there are about 16 studies in the literature now that assess the efficacy of antiretroviral therapy and their impact on various aspects of neurologic disease, survival with neurologic disease, cognitive impairment per se, um, and other, other related issues. There, um, and this was reviewed very nicely by Bruce Brew in a recent issue of uh, BMC Neurology. Um, and I'm going to make a long story short because Bruce did a really exhaustive meta-analysis with uh, Lucette Sistique, but essentially the neural heart regimens are, uh, were effective over, um, overall in terms of uh, improving neurocognitive function, um, uh, and they also there was an accompanying uh, suppression of uh, CSF viral load, but really only two studies were adequately powered to make definitive conclusions. So that's, a, uh, that's a, a, a real concern. The studies are, are essentially all observational. And uh, this needs, uh, needs attention. I'll come to that in a moment. There are also a couple of other sort of idiosyncratic studies. There's a study from Kevin Robinson that suggested when actually people stopped their antiretroviral therapy, there's certain, and up to 96 months, patients actually did not get worse. The mean score is a measure of their neurocognitive performance, and, the, um, and over a, a 96-month period, patients uh, did not actually worsen. In fact, some, some suggestion that actually they improved. I'm not so convinced by that, but they certainly didn't worsen, which is, makes you wonder how effective uh, uh, antiretroviral therapies as we're delivering it in terms of neurologic disease. But I think to summarize that this is a, an evolving and uh, very exciting area. Um, certainly higher CPE scores are associated with improved survival. I didn't have time to talk about that. It also looks like to have an effective um, neuro heart regimen or neuro cart as some call it, uh, you really need three uh, effective antiretroviral drugs. And finally, I think this situation calls for a longitudinal randomized control trial to really study this question. It'll be very difficult to do because of previous drug ex uh, exposure, but nonetheless, to really answer this question definitively, I think you can do it. You can do it in animal studies to some extent, but, uh, but I think a real clinical trial is, uh, will be the uh, uh, gold standard. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about another subject that I think is uh, uh, something that we face in the clinic uh, daily, in fact, which is uh, neurological immune reconstitution syndrome, or neuroiris. Um, it's a paradoxical deterioration in neurological status at the time of initiating, uh, initiating combination or highly active antiretroviral therapy. Uh, neuroiris uh, occurs despite a rise in CD4 counts. It's very much like the systemic iris that Martin French described over a decade ago, um, with a rise in CD4 count and a drop in viral load. And the risk factors, as you might expect, uh, include uh, pre-existing neurologic disease, PML being a major culprit, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, CNS-TB, uh, cryptococcal meningitis, uh, and in fact HIV dementia, because um, and that, uh, uh, as well as a very low CD4 counts, um, and, uh, and it's more common in patients who are heart naive, but not exclusively in that group. 
Other, uh, the risk factor, it's the general risk factor for our systemic iris is uh, seven to 30%, depending on the study. The risk of neuro iris uh, that we found in our, in our group was about 1% of, of patients, so not, not as severe. Um, its prevalence is higher with some opportunistic infections, particularly tuberculosis. And uh, this is, a, the Subei study is, was done in Thailand and they have found very high rates of iris in that group. It's a distinctive clinical uh, syndrome. Patients usually present with hemiparesis, confusion and encephalopathy accompanying its seizures. Uh, uh, may, they may or may not have fever. There's usually uh, pleocytosis or increased uh, s cells in the spinal fluid, that, uh, 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 but not always. Um, and it usually occurs anywhere from 10 to 60 days after the initiation of heart um, in, uh, um, in patients who uh, had not been previously exposed. This is, these are just a couple of examples. This is a, the patient one is a, a woman who'd had a minor neurocognitive disorder. She, uh, there was some delay. She had an MR scan because of the minor neurocognitive disorder. She uh, waited several months before she actually got on antiretroviral therapy. And then uh, soon thereafter, she developed uh, um, uh, uh, neuroiris, where she became profoundly confused, delirious, and had a couple of seizures. And you can see that she's accumulated new white matter changes in the frontal lobes. I'm sorry, I won't be able to point that out to you, but in the right upper hand uh, panel, she has white matter changes. The second patient is a gentleman from uh, 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 Somalia who we saw, um, who uh, presented with pulmonary tuberculosis, very low CD4 count. The concern was that his pulmonary tuberculosis was, uh, was a uh, uh, really overwhelming problem. He got started on, on antiretroviral therapy um, very quickly. He was asymptomatic neurologically, but then soon thereafter, within several weeks of initiating antiretroviral therapy, he developed seizures and confusion, and you can see his MR uh, panel C, um, uh, um, lots of white matter changes, but also involving the cortex. So that distinguishes it from PML, because the cortex is involved. And then when he was treated, he, uh, uh, he was actually treated with steroids, and, uh, and, uh, and then he went on to do very well, actually. And actually, I just saw him in the clinic a few weeks ago, and he's seizure-free, and he's back at work and doing very well. Many patients, that's the story. They do exceedingly well after these events. Of course, we don't want them to happen. There are a subset of patients who don't do so well, and it's usually those patients with PML, mainly because the uh, prognosis for that uh, dreadful disease is, uh, is, remains very poor. What is the pathology? It's largely a CD8 CTL driven disease pathogenesis. And that's uh, shown, this is a slide from Avi Nath's group. Um, uh, CD8 cell infiltrates is uh, illustrated in panel D and E. There are, there are also CD4 cells, but the CD8 cells uh, we think are the major effector cells. Um, you also see macrophage activation as well. And the, this is the same uh, p point is made here that when you actually count cells in the brain, um, whether it's from PML or from uh, uh, iris in patients with multiple sclerosis or, or patients with HIV, you still see a preponderance of uh, uh, CD8 or uh, CTLs, as illustrated uh, here. So why is it? Why are we more aware of neuro iris than we were a decade ago? It was around a decade ago. If you look in the literature, you'll actually see there were isolated cases. Well, I suspect it's because heart is more efficient than it was. Um, the other thing, uh, a second issue is that uh, um, what is the underlying pathogenesis? It looks like it's a CTL-related phenomenon. The CTLs are proliferate in response to suppression of uh, the, the virus is being suppressed by the antiretrovirals, allowing T cells in general to proliferate, particularly those uh, CD8 cells, but they're dysregulated because usually the T regulatory cells or T regs, their recovery in most instances is much more is delayed in HIV infection, which often will uh, allow for dysregulation of CD8 cells with, that will go after the target antigens within the brain. So what about management? Well, it's really critical to exclude other diseases. That's uh, such as TB, PML, uh, where it's not entirely clear, such as in the second patient I showed you. Uh, 
And that requires, uh, and you have to think out of the box, could it be something else as well, such as HIV, HSV encephalitis um, or drug effects? Neuroimaging, a lumbar puncture, and frequently an EEG is uh, useful strategies. Um, what about treatment? <clears throat> Glucocorticoids are certainly used. There are no RCTs to support it, but it's, uh, it uh, has been used. Stopping heart does not seem very appealing. Maybe ch changing the heart regimen, as I'll get to in a moment, may be effective, but it doesn't sound appealing to stop hearts. There also, there's also a lot of discussion about using anti-cytokine therapies and also blocking leukocyte, i.e. CTL, infiltration of the nervous system. That comes with its own um, bag of tricks, and I think it's uh, something that we'd have to consider carefully. Um, though, as I mentioned, the long-term outcome for neuroiris is variable. I've shown you a couple of good instances, but uh, uh, depending on the underlying disease, particularly PML, or, or if it's very advanced dementia, uh, the prognosis is not so good um, as... Um, um, as, uh, as seen in many studies. I also want to add to this that iris, I suspect, is a much broader issue. We have a, a paper coming out uh, in JID in the next few weeks where we've actually described iris in a patient who received the Milwaukee protocol for, uh, for rabies encephalitis. And that patient was immunosuppressed as a consequence of the Milwaukee protocol, which is a neuroprotective strategy. But uh, actually, the patient developed iris as a consequence. And I think, and it's been recognized now in transplantation, um, in MS uh, uh, treated patients as well. So that's um, something that uh, I think uh, the for the clinicians and other, other people in the, uh, in the audience, it's worth keeping in mind. Okay, so hepatitis C, I, I want to talk about that because that's a growing problem in Canada and, or, and actually North America. I think you all know it's a, a flavivirus. There are multiple subtypes. Um, it, uh, it's also highly mutagenic, like HIV. First described or, or discovered by Mike Houghton, um, uh, who, uh, who's at now at the University of Alberta um, with his team uh, at Chiron. There are about 170 million people infected globally, and that's probably a conservative estimate. There may be as many uh, as uh, 200 million. Uh, about 10% are uh, co-infected with HIV. It's now recognized that hep C is associated with, uh, with um, neurologic disorders. There is a recognized hep C encephalopathy. Um, patients describe sort of chronic fatigue, um, so-called brain fog. They, uh, they, but also they display on neuropsych psychological testing, impaired working memory, poor concentration, and, um, uh, and difficulty with learning. Um, they also exhibit features of neuropathy, uh, can be difficult to distinguish from uh, HIV-related uh, neuropathy as well. We know the virus gets into the brain. This is a uh, slide from Eliza Maslia, and you can see the uh, HCV core protein in the brain. It infects glial cells, not unlike HIV. It's, uh, it's also associated with uh, uh, some degree of uh, neuronal loss um, and uh, gliosis. That's in, in mono-infected patients. But of course, we're talking about uh, uh, HIV infection, um, and we, uh, we know that uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, um, uh, we, can, we can show that hep C can in, certainly infect uh, um, uh, glial cells in the brain. This is work from our group showing that hep C infects both uh, astrocytes and microglia. And I didn't show you this here, but if you co-infect, you actually amplify the virus uh, in, the, uh, in the brain or in these in, infected cells uh, in vitro. And you can detect viral proteins, both core and uh, NS3, non-structural protein 3, as illustrated here. What about clinical disease? Well, certainly the, uh, the, there are many uh, uh, hep C, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, uh, exhibits features similar to HIV. When we looked at the risk overall, prevalence of neurologic disease amongst mono-infected, HIV-infected patients versus HIV and hep C-infected patients, we found the risk of seizures was greater, as illustrated here. Uh, in this graph, the risk of having, the, there was a greater likelihood of having two or more neurologic disorders. And again, if you have hep C in the context of HIV with neurologic disease, your survival is, is diminished. I also say, I won't have time to say this or talk about this, but the severity of neurocognitive impairment amongst patients who are dual or uh, dual infected was, uh, was worse um, in, in those patients. So I think there are multiple issues uh, that to be considered. What is the role of hep C replication in the CNS? Does it, does it really accentuate or exacerbate disease? What are the hep C receptors? Um, is uh, H, uh, CSF, HC, HCV uh, levels, is that predictive? 
So far, it doesn't look like it is. And finally, with the new hep C drugs, how is that going to impact on neurologic disease? And that remains to be seen. Okay, in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about a new subject um, that, uh, that we've been working on in my lab. Um, uh, many of you he have heard about the Human Microbiome Project. It's funded by the NIH, and there's a lot of interest in, in, in HIV, particularly the gut, uh, how the a HIV infection influences the gut. Uh, does it increase uh, transmicrobial uh, or microbial translocation, such as suggested by Danny Duick and others? Um, do we do know that the composition of the uh, gut microbiome influences behavior. Work from Steve Collins's group at the uh, um, at McMaster University has shown that, and other groups. So it's it's clear that the microbiome is a player in H HIV pathogenesis, one way or another. Um, but the question is, is 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 the brain actually does it have its own microbiome? And the dogma has been certainly uh, since uh, Richard and I were in medical school, that the brain is a sterile organ, that there are no bacteria there. Well, it's not as simple as that, because we've known for years that when you do uh, studies of comparing various viruses and bacteria in brains of people with and without uh, an uh, ostensible neurologic disease, you find that the controls also have uh, bacteria and viruses in the brain. And so that prompted us to ask the question, is the, bacteria, is the bacterial composition and load different amongst patients with HIV infection versus those without? And so we began taking a very sort of systematic approach whereby we looked for bacterial uh, molecules. Uh, in, this in this case, we looked at peptidoglycan. You can see on the left-hand side. We found that peptidoglycan in the brains of people without and with HIV uh, infection. These are patients with advanced AIDS who had not received antiretroviral therapy. And on the right side, I'm showing you microglial cells that are CD45 positive to give you a sense of the size. We also found bacteria by in situ hybridization, um, again, uh, both intracellular and extracellular. And in addition, in the, right, in the right hand panels, we had the high mag, we saw again bacterial, uh, uh, this peptidoglycan in the, back, in the uh, tissue parenchyma. We also saw it in the blood vessels as illustrated by the uh, circle. So that really prompted us to think, gee, there must be bacteria in the brain. So let's try and define what types of bacteria are there in the brain. These are from autopsy specimens, but we've also done a lot of surgical specimens as well, and essentially the studies are the same. But I will say right up front that the bacterial burden in the brain did not differ between people with and without advanced AIDS. So we actually sequenced, doing conventional sequencing, we looked at uh, what, we looked at, uh, sequenced the 16S ribosomal RNA, and we found that in fact, indeed, there were many bacteria there, um, and that uh, we found it in brain, we also found it in leukocytes, we didn't find any, blood, any uh, bacteria in, uh, in serum. Uh, despite looking pretty hard, using an amplified, uh, nested protocol. We also did deep sequencing on the same samples. <clears throat> so this was uh, massively parallel sequencing using the Illumina system. And again, we found that there were bacteria in the brain. All these samples we examined, there was bacteria in the brain. And essentially, to make a long story short, we found that actually alpha proteobacter were the, were the bacteria that were present in the brain both in, in autopsy specimens as well as uh, surgical specimens. We didn't find them in, in uh, fetal specimens, predictably. We also looked at the relationship this, uh, of uh, uh, bacterial burden and host responses. This is uh, using a, you, and where we correlated the bacterial burden with the expression of individual host genes. And many of the genes that have been implicated in HIV-related neuropathogenesis came up, such as uh, TNF-alpha, uh, 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 insulin, um, uh, my, some myelin proteins as well, they, see, they appeared in this network that we developed looking at host responses, suggesting that indeed there's maybe some relationship between the bacterial burden and the relative uh, immune response, or host response, because we also looked at some cell, other cell uh, uh, or host uh, uh, molecules as well. So if you thought that you had a dirty mind, you may or may not have a dirty mind, but you probably do have a dirty brain. So, so what are the future issues in, in neuroaids? Well, I think a big question remains, what, is the t uh, what about the time of initiation of heart? I think that's an issue that, uh, and with uh, treatment as prevention is a, uh, a contemporary theme, that's, uh, uh, this becomes a big issue. Um, we need new cost and time efficient biomarkers. Um, and that's a, a, that I think will become a reality using strategies such as uh, high throughput uh, studies such as mass spec, um, 
uh, on, on using biospecimens, as well as uh, more refined uh, neuropsychological uh, testing. Um, pathogenesis of neuroiris, as well as the interaction between hand and heart, really needs to be uh, uh, delineated more clearly. I didn't talk about neuroprotective strategies uh, in the interest of time, but there's a lot of interest in developing neuroprotective strategies, such as uh, uh, stra using neurotrophins, um, using uh, various uh, neurotransmitter receptor antagonists. Um, so finally, I just want to thank uh, people who uh, I've worked with over the last few years. Tremendous people in my lab. You'll m mention, uh, see v Tarn Vivathanaporn, who uh, has gone, she's from Bangkok, and she's gone back and established her own lab at uh, Meadal University. Jen McComb, some of you know, who's a neurologist who I work with at the University of Alberta. Many excellent collaborators, uh, two friends and colleagues who I call upon often, John Gill and uh, Stan Houston, uh, as well as uh, Rob Holt, who helps us with the uh, deep sequencing. And also, I can't thank the members of the clinics enough. The nurses, Christina and Darcia, Ted and, uh, and Sarah, as well as the social workers and, uh, and pharmacists as well. And finally, the funding agencies whom we revere and fear at times. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take a question or two.